Thank you for joining us for this comparables modeling quick lesson. As always, to learn about more advanced modeling techniques used in investment banking, please visit our website at www.wallstreetprep.com. Um, in this quick lesson, I'm going to walk you through a comps model template. I'm going to walk you through the look and feel of what is probably the most common investment banking analysis that you would perform. Uh, and we're actually going to start the screen that you see here in front of you. We're actually going to start with the output page. Um, so what you typically see in a comps model is an output page and an input page. And the input page is just like it sounds where you put in all the input data and the output page takes that data and presents it in a way that's useful for analysis. Um, the goal of this quick lesson essentially is to give you guys a feel for what an actual comps model looks like and to highlight some of the um, some of the real key ideas, nuances, and, and to some extent challenges of a comps model. Um, I would say when sort of thinking about the ranking of complexity of investment banking models, um, this one actually ranks pretty low. It is probably the simplest um, investment banking type of model that you'll build. Um, now comparing that to more complicated M&A models, LBO models, um, DCF models, as well as building an operating model, all of which we cover in our quick lessons as well. Um, but the idea here is you actually building so many of these and there are nuances and there are ways that this can get a little bit tricky, um, that it's worth understanding the framework. It also tends to pop up in a lot of investment banking and general finance interview questions, just understanding how comps fits in within the general valuation framework. So why don't we get started? What you see, here, I'm going to zoom in a little bit and I'm going to start in the sort of the top area. And what we're building here in this uh, comps output, or what we're seeing in this comps output, um, are four comparables. Uh, we see Extreme Networks, uh, which is the company that we want to analyze, as well as three of its peers, Brocade, Juniper, and Netgear. Uh, the first thing that we see are is the ticker symbol, as well as the market cap and the enterprise value that's been uh, that's been pulled in from the input page, which I'll uh, walk you through in a moment. And the next thing, uh, the next sort of several things you're actually seeing are the values of various operating metrics for all four peers in the peer group. First is on an LTM basis, and this is fairly typical. You're going to want to see revenue, EBITDA, and EBIT, as well as earnings per share uh, on a last 12 months basis, or over the last 12 months, what do these companies uh, generate? The next uh, thing that you'll see is on a year one forecast basis. Um, and that's on a calendar year. We want a lot of companies report off calendar year uh, fiscal years. And so we want to standardize that to a calendar year, which creates its own set of challenges, as you'll see in the input page. Um, and then lastly, we see a year two forecast. And so what we're seeing here and that this sort of serves to highlight very quickly that in this peer group, Juniper is the biggest, having the biggest market cap. Um, having the biggest revenue uh, and the biggest EBITDA and EBIT and uh, earnings per share, which is sort of standardized against a an arbitrary, effectively an arbitrary share count, uh, doesn't actually tell us much about the size of the company. The other, the other metrics are far more informative. So we see that Juniper is the biggest. And in fact, our target, the company that we want to analyze, Extreme Networks, is um, by far the smallest. Um, and, and what that tells us is, um, one of several things. Either we we really need to look at and try to find other peers in the peer group that are sort of more directly, uh, that are more the right size, or uh, or in fact, we did our diligence and it's just that Extreme is in an industry where they are really the smallest player. And so actually selecting the peer group is one of the things we get into in our uh, financial modeling uh, courses in great detail because that's actually one of the biggest challenges of a comps analysis, to figure out what is the right peer group. So once we have those operating met, uh, metrics laid out, you'll also see an operating metric called long-term growth rate. Um, and where that comes from is most uh, sell-side research analysts will, in addition to publishing forecasts for revenue, EBITDA, EBIT, and earnings per share, they also publish what they call a long-term growth rate forecast, which is effectively a five-year out earnings growth rate. And as you see, um, whereas Juniper is probably the most, uh, the biggest company, 
Uh, Netgear seems to have, uh, there's a consensus that Netgear is a, is a higher growth type of business. Um, and we'll see what that means in terms of their multiples and valuation. That's what we're going to get to in a moment here. So let's scroll down. And now that we have the, the basic metrics laid out, we can actually say a lot about uh, what the multiples look like. So if you, when you want to do a comps analysis, you don't look at absolute metrics and compare those. Rather, you look at enterprise value divided by or equity value or price per share divided by that operating metrics to standardize against the size issue. So we can actually compare a company like Extreme that is so small compared to uh, Juniper that's so much bigger. And what we see is on an LTM basis, there are, um, you know, these companies have uh, different multiples. So let's look at the enterprise value to revenue multiple. And you'll see that Juniper, Juniper is actually trading at a significantly higher revenue multiple to, um, to Extreme and Netgear. Um, if you look at the PE ratio, it sort of flips. Uh, and you see Extreme Networks trading at the highest PE ratio in the group, uh, whereas Netgear is trading at the lowest PE ratio of the group. That actually doesn't tell us much until we dive into the financials. Um, having already looked through the financials, I can tell you that the reason the PE ratio for Extreme Networks on an LTM basis is so high is because they had an unusually low earnings in that in that year as opposed to anything um, that would signify that that you know the, the market really likes extreme networks uh, compared to its peers so um, in fact you can sort of corroborate this by going over to the year two forecast where the earnings are more normalized and you see that extreme networks PE multiples are right in line uh, with the rest of the peer group um, and it does, and this is actually fairly consistent across most comps analyses that the sort of year two and the year one forecast, since they do reflect more normalized assumptions for operating metrics, actually have um, tighter bands around the, uh, the multiple ranges. Lastly, the peg ratio represents the price to earnings over the long-term long growth rate, which is, which is a way to really standardize for the fact that, hey, um, if you're trading in a certain PE multiple um, and yet you know, if you're trading at a really high PE multiple, um, let's standardize that against growth expectations um, to really take the growth expectations out of the equation to figure out whether um, an equity is being overvalued or undervalued. And so what we see is on a peg ratio basis, um, it looks like Juniper, which perhaps if you had looked on a straight multiples basis without considering the fact that it's a high growth company, um, does appear, had you just looked at multiples as opposed to sort of reconciling that against the high growth, you would have thought, oh, maybe they are, um, you know, maybe these guys are fairly, you know, are fairly valued. Um, but if you look at, um, if you look at it against the fact that they're trading at 20%, um, they're, you know, most expect a very high long-term growth rate for them, that may suggest that they are actually more undervalued than, than, the multiples themselves would, would show. And that's really the goal of the peg ratio. So the final, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit to sort of give a more holistic view of this. And what you see is that if you compare extreme, and I'll focus on the year two forecast, just because extreme has a lot of noise in the LTM calculation that I'll talk about when we get to the inputs page. But what you can see is that really extreme is just about in line with its peers. And we can draw interesting conclusions from that. We have to have a lot of confidence about or awareness of sort of w whether our peer group is truly a peer group, uh, whether we have enough peers in our peer group. Um, but ultimately the goal of this analysis is to be able to say something like, okay, well, um, these guys are trading in line with uh, their peers. Or if you get a different, if you get a different output, uh, you could come up with uh, perhaps a different thesis. Okay, we're gonna stop right there. In the next video, we're gonna to turn to the input page, which is where all the action is in, uh, in terms of data entry here. And we'll talk about some of the nuances of data entry in a comps model.